Los Angeles, between 1970 and 1990, that, that period of time, 70 to 90, 20 years, I didn't think art world, per se. I thought the world of artists. I didn't know galleries. I didn't know museums. I never, I didn't have, I had a gallery I, I had one, I had one, I knew, I knew of some interesting galleries. There's a gallery that, Eugenia Butler, which showed Diderot, uh, Kossuth, Warhol. And there was another one called Nicholas Wilder, which showed Bruce Nauman. That's, I know that a little later, but it, it, I knew that in the, the 72 or three. So there were these galleries, but I had, little to do with them. Nick Wilder was supportive of me, but I didn't have shows in galleries. <coughs> and I didn't know any museum people. And I mean, I, literally, I, I don't know. In my entire period of being in the art world in LA, I, I don't know. Maybe I've been to a collector's house eight, nine times, I think. Maybe more, but not much. And very little connection to the museums up until 90. Up, uh, up until 1990. So it's not a world around the art world. It's a world around artists. And LA, I think, was at that period of time, at least in the circles that I was in, it was very much about just art. Uh, some people, had, you know, like, Chris Burden had galleries, uh, Nauman had galleries, like there were Ed Ruscha, of course, Baldessari, all that. But so many of the people I knew didn't have galleries. So it wasn't a, an art world that we know today at all, like completely. It was really an, alter, an alternative art world, of which performance, performance, uh, political action, feminism, uh, art as uh, involvement in education systems, all this, communal, uh, collectives, all this was about, and for me, very much about performance. Like I'm pretty much at that point, I've given up painting. Like I'm, it's kind of there. Even drawing at that point, yes, it's going on, I'm making drawings, but it's, it's much less than it is right now. So in 1990 is kind of when, uh, for me, the, what we know of as the art world happens. And it's significant because <coughs> you have a, a really critical change in the art world in, I think, the 80s. And uh, you could say it's unfair but you could say there was a signifier and that was Mary Boone. You could say that, it's unfair to her, but it, that whole change happens. And it's so many of the people I knew in the 70s who were quote, conceptual performance, uh, feminists, uh, political action artists, all this stuff, really didn't see the writing on the wall. Like it, was really, during that whole period, you know, the, one of the comments was painting's dead, right? And art as life and art as action was much more part of it. And once, the, once the painting begins, it's interesting how it also comes out of a conceptual model. Like, if you look at the painters that affect that, you know, like Schnabel and and uh, Clementi and David Sally. David Sally came out of Baldessari's classes or Wolfgang Storkel's classes at CalArts. They, they had a conceptual bump, right? And 
Then you have Sigmar Polke and Gerhard Richter and Boslitz and uh, Clementi in Europe. And it's very, very connected to a performance notion. And they, so a whole, a whole uh, genre of painting is forming in the 80s. And I remember in the mid 80s, I quit sort of doing public performances in 83 or something. And a lot of artists had stopped in the 70s, or in Europe, they'd actually stopped in the 60s. But uh, in 80, I sort of stopped performance. When I stopped, the last performances I did, I began to think in terms of, I, I had been creating performances that used uh, a, a form, like architecture in a way, like I would put all the seats of the of the audience in the shape of a boat, then I would be a sea captain. So there was this thing of, you know, if there was a stage, I would immediately go into the audience. There was this thing of playing with the with the the space. But one thing that it began to happen was the idea of constructing a space which was really to construct a set. And the reason that was happening, be back in the 70s, it goes back to an interest in Hollywood, but almost out of an appropriation of Hollywood, right? And I had worked in the film studio some in the 70s. And I was really interested in this idea of, uh, the, of the sound stage. The sound stage was really interesting to me. And the lot, the Paramount lot and the sound stage. And then the set, the film set inside the sound stage. So you would have this outdoor thing. You could have a, a yard, you could have a house, and that house may not even have a back. It may have a series of other rooms which are connected for the film itself. But not so you would go, you go in the living room, you go out of the, you, you think you're going into the kitchen, you go out and you're just standing in the sound stage, but over there is the uh, kitchen. And that experience to me was very, that was like, wow, this is a disassociating space. This is sculpture and they fucking don't know it. Like they think they're making a, they're making a product out there and they don't realize what they just made is a really interesting structure of disassociation. And it, like you would go, you'd be in a house that was a living room and you'd enter a garage as you went through the door. So these, this thing of the set was really interesting to me. And so what I kind of, Right at the end of, uh, in 83, the last few performances were, yeah, right around 80, 80, between 80 and 83, I started involving sets and wanting to use sets. Oh, you little piece of shit, now you're Whoa. getting the idea. I knew you could come through like a piece of shit you are. No, hey, hey boy, boy, boy. Ah! No. Ah! I do a piece with Mike Kelly where I ask him and I, I make a set for the piece. It's a room. And then in 91, I make two pieces at the exact same time. One's a sculpture, a kinetic sculpture, which is a garden where one man, a, a rubber figure, uh, I was really interested in the rubber figures. The rubber figures are the you know, wax museums, the uncanny. And the uncanny, it, for me, it was directly related to Disneyland. 
there are Pirates of the Caribbean, uh, the Lincoln character, the, the and sculpture, uh, sculpt, uh, the sculpture in Disneyland, sculpture in Disneyland, and the being interested in in that, and I was really interested in wax figures, and the other one is Hollywood in the set. Of course, Disneyland is a utopia, right? This kind of weird utopia, <coughs> fucked up utopia. Um, so I, I embody, so in 91, I make the garden, which is uh, about 30 by 40 feet with trees, out of big tall trees. And the trees come out of, uh, they were actually trees used in Bonanza, which is strange because it comes back to this piece. But, um, I'd gotten these trees, made this forest, and there's two rubber figures, two males, an older male and a younger male, and the older male is standing and is fornicating with the tree. The younger male is lying on the ground, fornicating with the dirt. And I viewed it as a, an object in which the trees around, the, all these bushes and trees, made it so the viewer on the outside looking in had to bend down and get themselves in a position and become like a voyeur, become like a peeping Tom into this scene of the one man on the ground and the one man standing. The reason it was an older man and a younger man was all about male conditioning. The older man dressed as a businessman is teaching the younger man and he's teaching him, you know, uh, how to fornicate with nature. And, but yet the viewer is uh, peering in and has to change their body position in order to see what's going on. And the critical thing there was something else. That is, is that I was watching television on Belize television about Belize. It was a documentary on Belize. And they were talking about Belize being obsessed with the Chicago Cubs. And there's all these Chicago Cubs fans in Belize. Reason is they watch it on television. They watch Chicago Cubs on television in Belize. And I thought, fuck, there it is. There's the signifier right there. There's the standpoint. America looks at itself and the rest of the world watches America, right? But they have no idea what's going on on the outside. It's a little, so that piece was a lot about a male about men, conditioning men, and also that the corporate entity was creating an isolated situation in which Americans just looked at themselves. They just watched themselves, their own arrogance. But it's not because they're overtly arrogant, it's just that the situation becomes arrogant and the rest of the world watches them. So the piece was that. The other piece, made at the exact same time, was called Bossy Burger. Okay, good. That's fine. They just got nothing else to do. I go back to here. Back to here, it's totally strong. That's some cover. I come back to here. That's some mic. I come back to here. This is your town. I just go back to here. That's some mic. And Bossy Burger, I get a set from a television set. Uh, sitcom. And it's the entire set of a hamburger or a fast food restaurant. But it's normally sets are made so it makes a shape like that. And the cameras sit here and look in like this. My set, I didn't want it like that. You know, like everybody said, oh, you should make it like that. I made an enclosure in which the character can never leave. So the set is rearranged into 
a enclosure, uh, a trap that was referred to as a trap in which the character never moves out of an absurdity. And that in, re, in, in the reality that humans have constructed, what we've constructed, everything around us is a construction. What we've constructed is an, what we've constructed is an absurdity, a complete absurdity. And the most, the most, the, the, the most extreme, and the most where the absurdity gets the most absurd and the most ugly is in violence. So we constructed the rest of it, like we wander around and buy stuff. We wander around, we have clothes. I'm part of the same thing. I mean, that's one part is that like, I'm not out of this. It's not like I'm not part of this thing, right? And we have these absurdities and then you have this class structure, which is at this point creating, we live in a world in which it's really getting fucked up because the rich are really getting richer and the poor are really suffering, like on a monumental level and moving with possibly climate change, we're even moving towards an even more disaster, but a disaster that will first affect the, uh, the poor. That's where it's gonna go first, right? So the rich will sort of mingle their way, <clears throat> but, it's going to cause calamity, I think. We'll see. Let Who me, knows? Let me hold you there. there. I would like to continue at that point, but there are some questions. Uh, one question I would like to ask, because looking back through your career, there are some elements that you already mentioned that are like a red line. For example, you have always used yourself as a character, not only behind the camera, but also in front of the camera. Then there's this focus on, on architecture, on claustrophobic violent scenes. You're very outspoken. I mean, you see the liquids, you see sex, you see pornography. There are certain elements that go through your career. Why, why is that? Why are they important? And why have you used Look, yourself? You know, I think what we have is, <coughs> is a, okay, that's the most interesting part that you've asked is why myself. The other one I'm getting to, the reason those other things exist is because they exist in the world. It's like, and are we looking at them? Somebody's got to look at them, right? So I, <coughs> I think, you know, the, the answer to why myself, right? It, 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 I mean, it, you know, there could be, uh, uh, one thing uh, which, it's either, there's a psychological part, why Paul wants to use himself in these things, why that, why that, psychologically, why, Let's peer into Paul's psyche to figure out why he does that. That's one. The other side to that is I do come out of a situation in which very prominent in my uh, in acceptance and introduction into art is the body as material and the body as sculpture. And sculpting myself meant sculpting my life. So I become in a certain way using my body as, one of the first pieces I did, and one of the first realizations of, uh, uh, of art and the body is that, it happened sort of simultaneous two pieces. One was back in 67, 1967. One was, uh, um, a friend tells me about Yves Klein. Seeing an image of Yves Klein was impossible. Like, I didn't know how to find one, right? Like, the library didn't have Yves Klein books in it, right? So, he had somehow, he was from New York, he tells me about Yves Klein, he tells me about this piece of Yves Klein and the leap into the void. It's not described that way. It's not described as a leap into the void. <coughs> it's, and, it, and the position is not described. It's not like a position of leaping out and like this, like this sort of uh, dive. <clears throat> uh, 
it's just that he leaps from, uh, and it's described incorrectly as he leaps from a balcony, which is not exactly true, I don't think. It wasn't a balcony. But so it's described wrong. So at one point, but it has a real effect on me. Like I'm really like, wow, that's pretty, that's a work of art. Somebody did this. It's before I know of Gutai. It's before I know of, of uh, it's like the first, you know, 66, maybe it was 66. First sort of like, oh, I might have been circling around Capro a little bit. I might have known something. I was certainly aware of the beat generation and all that. But <clears throat> I then, as a, a fulfilling of an assignment in a sculpture class to make a kinetic sculpture, I leap out of the window. I jump out of the window. So when my turn comes to show my kinetic sculpture, I go to the window and jump out. And it's a two-story jump. It's not too bad, you know, I don't know, 16, 18 feet. Like, far enough, I, onto some lawn. I could have done something, but I jump standing, like, so I land on my feet, right? Because I've never seen the image of uh, Klein. And then years later, I see the image. I'm kind of blown away. I think of myself as that what I did was sort of pathetic and cartoonish, but kind of interesting, you know, like in a misinterpretation of the, of the, cap, of the Klein piece. And then years later, find that the Klein piece, he leaps into uh, a stretched uh, piece, of, a bunch of men holding like a, a kind of trampoline thing, you know, not knowing that at first. So I don't know the image. The other piece is that I, I, some friends and I used to go and hang out at the sand dunes and, you know, what young people do, smoke and drink and all this stuff. And I am up there in the sand dune and we decide to have a race down the sand dune. And there's three of us and we start running down the sand dune, this steep sand dune, and it's a race. The other two guys are much bigger than I am. And one point, the one guy falls and pretty soon the other guy, I'm ahead. And all of a sudden I realize I'm not really running, I'm falling. The momentum of running down the hill and the angle of the hill is such that at one point I'm just falling, trying to keep balance and I crash. And it's kind of, it's an interesting, I have kind of a, like I knew about the climb thing and then it was kind of like, wow, that was interesting because it was significant. Like somehow I was, I had gone down this hill and at one point was out of control. So this idea of going from control to out of control in this, and I repeated that thing as a performance over the years for the next three years called Too Steep, Too Fast. And then at one point I do a similar piece in which I, with a friend, we both decide we will each do a performance for ours with for each other and we climb a mountain and he burns a bunch of little toy soldiers and I roll a bowling ball off the mountain so that which point the ball becomes me you know like there's a connection to like somehow a connection like a sculpture and I kept the bowling ball I still have it it's busted, but it, it made it to the bottom. <clears throat> terrifying, absolutely terrifying. Like at one point the ball is like eight, nine feet off the ground, just flying through trees. And it just would hit trees and snap them like branches. And that quite like amazing uh, thing. And uh, we photographed it. Later I did it again and photographed it doing it. So there were these this thing of the body and using the body and affecting myself for transformation. Very much part of a 60s, 70s mentality, right? This idea of the transformation. There's there's a thing that I'm interested in, and it comes back to the 
to around the 70s, I would say that I, I was improvisation and the involvement in improvisation. And that's, I'm not saying that what I do is completely improvisation, because it's not. Like, I write scripts that for these things that go on for days. Like, I, the rewrites end up uh, uh, 50 times. But what's going on there is really, the, is really something about writing. You know, it's, I'm constructing some type of narrative, but it really is another type of piece, right? Like, this idea of a script within Hollywood, of course scripts are used in all kinds of ways in, in, within uh, the world of film, but in my case, there's really a, a belief that the script is a separate thing. But what the script does, it, has, it creates a place to begin and it creates a place to return to. <clears throat> What's going on from the beginning to the return is that I'm looking for the unexpected, the improvisation, and the interest in improvisation in which something happens. Like, uh, I just saw that movie, uh, Behind the Wind, and then there was that other one, you know, uh, They'll Love Me When I'm Dead, I think that's the name of it. But, uh, Orson Welles describing uh, wanting the, I think he called it the divine accident? What did he call it, the divine accident? I was saying that the divine accident meaning something happening that you can't predict, right? And wanting to experience that. And in a way, in, in, in the improvisation, there's something of wanting, believing that the, what really mattered came from the, uh, the unexpected. Like, somehow the parts all fit at that moment. <clears throat> and for me, to be part of that is critical. I'm not as interested in being the voyeur to that experience. I'm very interested in being in the experience. And it's a way of, there's a thing that happens. Like, so even in these things, it, it's like, I'm always struggling with those who want to film it and those who want to be in it. And getting them to understand, getting those who want to film it to understand what it means to be in it. And then, and that, so there is this thing of, I, I want to continue that. And then what is happening is not just that I want to be in it for that experience, right? And that moment. And, and, and it's really, it's one of the reasons I make sculpture. Like sculptures are performances. I, I essentially have a, it's a performance that happens. Same with paintings. I've often painted in a kind of character or I talk while I'm painting. <laughs> What that does, by being in the character, I remove myself from the restrictions that I put on myself. 
like within normality, I have restrictions and they're culturally conditioned and they're there. If I break from that, then it allows me to have freedom. And that's a very important word. Freedom and love are two very important words. But <clears throat> it, it gives me a certain freedom. And then at the same time, what I'm describing there is a situation. I'm describing my view of the human situation, which involves me, because it's very much a subjective as well as objective point of view. It's both, it's not just one, it's subjective and objective. And so from that position, being in there, I'm trying to say something. And, you know, is it, does it, you know, somebody could say, oh, it's about therapy. Mm. It, I, I can't deny that art isn't, hasn't, doesn't have a therapeutic side to what, uh, for myself. But I don't think that's really the critical thing here, right, for me at this point, especially at this point. I, I'm just trying to get it done. It's really making the work is just trying to get it done. For what purpose? Because it's, in my, from my perception, it's necessary. And so, you know, it's complicated to say why I'm, it's me, but part of it is where I came out of, and part of it is what I've discovered by doing it. So much is about discovery. Like these pieces are ramblings. Like you could go, there's an idea, it begins, it could begin with an idea, it could begin with a situation of some sort. And then they start, and I start in a direction, and before I know it, it's off in another one, or before it's connecting, parts start connecting. Like, Two things start going like this, and pretty soon they're like this. It, it, it's, a, it's a kind of, a, I mean, you know, I, I sort of could describe it as a rhizome of some sort. The process is like a rhizome. And it's often not hierarchical. The other part of my question, why you are so explicit? We see sex, we see violence, we see things that we normally would sh shut our eyes to. And you see, well, they are out there. Somebody has to show them. Is that the role a of... a flippant answer, but yeah, I, did, I know I said it, but... <laughs> I would like to ask you, is that the role of art and an artist within our society to open our eyes for the things we find out there in the world? <clears throat> I, you, you know, I can't, there's, there's, the, the, what you just said, opening the viewer's eyes to what they can't see or what they deny or what remains hidden, well, yeah. But in another way, what's also there is it's just in my eyes. Like, it's, it's, it's part of what I see. It's part of what is around me. And it, it's, it's very much, like, sexuality is everywhere. Right? That goes very much part of people's lives. Los Angeles, California. Los Angeles. Silver Lake. Silver Lake. Yeah. Silver Lake. Hey. Yeah. What's your name? Adam. 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 Adam what? Adam Dick? Adam Dick Brain? Are you an actress, dear? Are you an actress? And to a degree, you know, I, when I made this piece, 
I, I, I said, you know, it had like, uh, it said uh, CSSSC, coach, stage, stage, coach. Then it said a, media, uh, a meditation on mediated violence. And it was a kind of way of me just getting started. Like I write this on the script, it's written on the first page on the first page. But we live in a world of mediated violence. You know, we live in a world of actual violence, but so much of that actual violence is mediated. So much of that actual violence is represented and into a fictional narrative of some sort or portrayed and we obsessionally look at it. So part of what this is, is about, in this piece, is about media. Part of it is about what's being shown to us, right? So I'm kind of in some personal, subjective way, and in some objective cultural critique in both things, deconstructing that for myself and for others. So much of it in a situation like this becomes about the people who are directly involved in it. They, they end up being part of this thing. They end up, it's this studio and this uh, these objects, uh, there's an incredible collaboration going on. You know, it's not just one and I'm, I'm a very much, a, and I'm very conscious that I'm a directing force. Like this is, I'm saying we got to make that salute. But it's a very much a collaborative thing. I do not edit the videos. Damon edits them. Uh, I may say, hey, I think this, or I think that. There may be a situation in which I start working more on editing, but the editing of the 150 terabytes of material, is, Eric and Damon will go through that. I'm on to the next thing. It, it, in a way, one of the things that happened to me, you know, I, I've, I've kind of described that I think, and I might have said, I think I said this to you a while back the other day, is that in this sort of trajectory of the art world in 2000 or something, around 2000 and one or two, I, I enter a privileged, a privileged situation in the art world. Prior to that, you could say up until the 90s, I'm in the alternative world and I'm content there. I'm, I'm content in the alternative world. I know nothing else. It's not like, uh, oh, I want to have a show at Costelli's. I'm not even thinking that. And then <coughs> through the 80s, it begins to change because of the upswing of the painting world and Mary Boone. It, that awareness starts changing a little. But, and then in the 90s, I make these two pieces. I show them in LA, and then that puts me in the art world. But in that period between 90 and 2000, I'm in, a, I'm in this new art world. The new art world of galleries, the beginning of art fairs, the beginning of people like Gagosian, the beginning of collector mentality, all this starts happening in the 90s for me. i am become aware of it. But it isn't 2000, until 2000 that I enter what is a, a privileged position within artists, a, an economic privilege, right? And uh, like, uh, fuck. It's a crazy world, and it's a construction. It, I, I, it, the more I know about it, the more I believe it's a construction. But I'm in this, I'm in this privileged plateau, and I had, you know, by mid '90s and that, I had a fantasy of appropriating a film studio or a soundstage. It was was a fantasy, and as a dysfunction, 
that it would not make the same thing. It would make something else. A, a completion of what I thought was happening back in the 70s when I moved here. I, it, it, the, the moving image and the importance of the moving image uh, as, an, as a, a medium and the belief that through technology and as technology, this notion of the moving image of however it was formed, I remember being very aware of the potential of virtual reality even back then or the hologram, or the three-dimensional film, or this, this idea that something, the moving image being important. And this idea of appropriation of a film studio, and that it was possible within, it was possible for me at that point within a plateau. And at the same time, to begin to work with other people, collectively. Like, I no longer wanted to make performances by myself. I didn't want to do, I wanted to do it with other people. Prior to that, if I used a stuffed teddy bear or a stuffed lion in a performance, they were a character. And I would say that, you know, if it was a narrative, it could be my grandfather, could be the neighbor, whatever, it could be something. And it, it was like using inanimate objects as a collaborative performers, right? And I would supply the, it's like what little kids do when they move cars around in the dirt or something, that kind of uh, idea, right? That kind of performance, that kind of play, kind of play, right? But in 2000, I began to want to make a studio that is an appropriation of a, of a soundstage and to begin to work with other people. And then it goes on the search for others. It's a search for others, right? And people have come and gone in this world that I've made, but it's very much collaborative. Like, you know, it's like, yeah, I write a script, then we meet. And, and then we enter a box. And the box, these boxes, really go back, all the way back to the dead age. They go all the way back to architecture, like their architecture forms, but they go back to minimalism. And minimalism and its connection to architecture, but minimalism and its connection to exterior and interior. Like Tony Smith's die is really a containment of a void. So that, for me, like the dead age, it's a minimal object that lies on the floor that references a human body, but at the same time, those cube, like those rectangular legs are hallways. They're architecture. So these are signifiers of the human trap. And they contain the void. And then what happens in there is a form of a dream. I've always kind of thought of what I was making was a dream. And what happened, it's, these are also referred to as skulls. Like that card that I described back before, that had the inside and the outside, or the front and the back, is called a skull card. And <clears throat> these are referred to as skulls. And the, it's the set as a skull, with a dream that is contained. In, in a certain way, it was connected to the elections, to what was going on in America, in American politics.